I just learned about HTTP smuggling and I'm starting my first ever scan against a target. It's running and seems to be going good and wow, it has found a valid issue? Time to head over to Google Bug Hunters because I want that sweet, sweet Google bounty. Wait, are we sure about that? This video is all about HTTP request smuggling false positives and let's get into it. I am Pink Draconian. I run a small YouTube channel where we talk about everything related to hacking from binary exploitation to web application hacking. Today I have the pleasure of partnering up with Google to talk about misconceptions concerning HTTP request smuggling. But before we can get into the misconceptions, let's first of all take three quick minutes to talk about HTTP request smuggling so we're all on the same page. Very often we talk with a web server and all we can see is a single machine that we talk to. However, that is not always the case in reality. A lot of infrastructure operates a very complex architecture where it seems like you're communicating with a single server, but in reality you are communicating with a load balancer or a reverse proxy, which is in turn going to traffic your requests to the real backend server where all the application knowledge lies. HTTP smuggling attacks target discrepancies between those two servers. They concern situations where the front end and the back end server may interpret requests in a different way, allowing the attacker to smuggle a request. And most of these issues arise due to one of two headers being misinterpreted by a server. The first here is the content length header, which is really straightforward. It just specifies the length of the body of a request. This way the server can say, okay, I am waiting for 11 bytes of content. The other header is the transfer encoding header, which can use chunked encodings. Albeit being more complex, it's still a fairly straightforward system. In the body, we define the amount of bytes we're going to send, followed by a new line and then the content. And we always end these chunked responses with a zero to signal the termination. But what if we send this request? What should the server do in this case? Well, in the case that both headers are present, the server should always prefer the transfer encoding header. Let's now say that we have a front-end server that doesn't implement that correctly. It makes a small mistake and decides to handle this request by using the content length header. It sends a request to the backend server, which handles it correctly. But when we submit a payload as such, we see that the front-end server sees the blue part as the body of the request, but the back-end server only sees the red part as the body of the request. This starts to cause a bunch of issues and we're smuggling this other request to the back-end server. The implications of this are plentiful. This could be used to bypass front-end security controls, such as blocking certain endpoints from being reached, to rewriting other users' requests, or even capturing their requests. But even that is just the tip of the iceberg. However, for now, all we need to know is that this is a big issue and this should be fixed as soon as possible. This vulnerability class is fairly complex to hunt for, which is why the use of tools can be incredibly valuable to researchers. However, their results should always be manually checked as the tools aren't perfect. They will have false positive cases where the tool will say something is vulnerable, whereas in reality that's not the case. This video started with a clip showcasing the very popular smuggler tool by Devparam. And don't get me wrong, this is an amazing tool that can be of great help when hunting, but it's not perfect. So before we haphazardly write a submission to Google Bug Hunters, let's double check our finding to see what really happened. The smuggler tool told us that it found a potential, note that word, CLTE issue. 
CLTE means the front-end server interpreted the length of the body by taking the content length, the CL header, whereas the back-end made use of the transfer encoding, the TE header. The tool outputs its findings in more depth in the payloads directory in this file here, and if we cat it, we can see that it shows us a request. Time to get that request in Burp so we can assess it. Over in Burp, let's dive deeper into this issue. We see that it indeed has the two headers and sending this request, we notice that it returns with posted message one backslash r backslash nz. On first sight, that would make sense since the front end server takes the content length headers value and sends that amount of bytes through. The back end server should then use the transfer encoding, chunked encoding to process the request. However, at that point, the last zero meant to terminate chunked encoding is missing. Thus, the server should still be waiting for something else instead of replying to us. That's odd. That's not what the tool told us it would do. But let's try this again with another example. Here we see that I've pretty much just duplicated this request. The idea here is that the front end will see all of this as one big message and the back end will use chunked encoding and split this up into two requests thus smuggling the second one. As output, we'd expect something like post a message and then nothing. However, when we actually do send the request, we see post a message followed by the entirety of the body. And it's evident that in this case, we did not succeed in smuggling the request. But that begs a question. Why did the tool flag this as being vulnerable? That's a great question that can have a bunch of different answers. However, in this case, it's explained by what we see when we send about 100 more requests. We see that some requests randomly take a long time to arrive, six to seven seconds, and this occurs randomly. Now, when looking at the tool's help menu, we see that it has a default timeout setting of five seconds. Thus, we can attribute this false positive finding to the server having some hiccups and responding very slowly in some cases. One way to really validate this would be by running the tool again and noticing that this time it doesn't find our endpoints to be vulnerable at all. Some key things to take away from this example are that you should always double check your findings. Rerun the tool that said something was vulnerable, but also check manually. See if it would be exploitable. These tips should help you get less false positive findings in the future. Now, if you want to learn more about verifying the output of tools, then please refer to this great article on the Google Bug Hunters University. Right now, I'm going to show you a really, really cool CVE. This is CVE 2020-12440 and it's... Wait, this candidate was withdrawn by its CNA. Further investigation showed that it was not a security issue. Okay, so this vulnerability wasn't actually a vulnerability. Well, mistakes happen and we can learn from that. Using a Wayback Machine, I gained access to the proof of concept attached to this CVE and let's take a look. So Nginx 1.18.0 allows an HTTP request smuggling attack that can lead to cache poisoning, credential hijacking, or security bypasses. That sounds pretty severe. The report contains three different requests that we can check out. The first one consists of two GET requests following each other. The first request has a content length of two, which would be the invisible CRLF here. Following that, we just have a second request. The server responds to all that with a 200 OK headers, some content, and another 200 OK headers and some content. So does this look like valid HTTP smuggling? Well, earlier I explained that request smuggling occurs when a discrepancy exists between how a front-end server and a back-end server handle the transfer encoding and content length header. But in this case, there is no transfer encoding header at all in this request. Moreover, the entire report doesn't even make mention of a setup having two servers communicating with each other. That sounds pretty conclusive. This is not a valid example of HTTP request smuggling. But what is this behavior that we are seeing? Why did the server respond to two GET requests in one single response? Well, that is called HTTP pipelining. Never heard of it? Well, that's because it's barely ever used. All modern browsers have disabled it by default years ago, and with HTTP 2 on the rise, there's no use for it anyway. So 
What is it? HTTP pipelining is a feature in HTTP 1.1 that allows multiple HTTP requests to be sent over a single TCP connection without having to wait for responses in between. Normally, you would send a request, wait for the response, send another request, wait, send, wait, send, wait, and so on. With pipelining, you can just send multiple requests and then wait for multiple responses. HTTP pipelining is one of the most common false positives you can run into when testing for HTTP smuggling. And in the request we discussed above, it was easy to see that this was not a valid request smuggling issue, but that is not always the case. Take the following request from the same report as before. In this case, we see a GET request that has both the content length and the transfer encoding header set. Following that, you have a GET request. Now, what do you expect the response to be here? Well, the actual response was a 200 OK followed by a 404 NOT FOUND. This is not in line with what this researcher expected, else he wouldn't have submitted this report. But what did he anticipate? Well, he probably expected the server to respond with a single 200 OK answer as the server would see this transfer encoding header being chunked and it would handle the request as such. Then I can only suppose that this uh, S at the end of the request is meant to poison the next user, as in, is request terminated here? So the server puts this S in the waiting line, the buffer, and when another user comes along with a request, the S is then prepended to their method, making it invalid. That's my theory here, but clearly from the response, that's not what happened. But why did the server not expect our chunked encoding? Well, time to dig into the RFCs. An RFC or a request for comments is a publication that details the standards for the internet. This is where you find in extreme detail how the internet is supposed to work. Ah, and right here in section 3.2.4 of RFC 7230, we can find the following regarding field parsing for headers. No white space is allowed between the header, field name, and colon. That clears everything up. Nginx is just adhering to the standards, and the standards say that it shouldn't accept this header, and thus, in this case, Nginx uses the content length header. With that vulnerability debunked, let's take a look at an actual case of request smuggling and what differentiates it from HTTP pipelining. If I send this request to a server where the front-end server uses the content length, and the backend server uses the transfer encoding header for determining the length of the request, what will happen? Well, the frontend server is going to send this entire request to the backend and say, hey, here's a request, I'm waiting for one response to this. The backend server in turn will get that request, use the transfer encoding header and go, hey, this request contains HTTP pipelining. I'm going to send back two responses to the frontend server. The front-end server then receives those two responses and says, well, I only wanted one response, so I'm going to forward this one response and the next one, well, I guess I'll keep it in the buffer. Then a user comes along and they request a page that does not exist. The front-end sees it and sends it across to the back-end. And before the back-end can even react with the 404 response, the front-end says, oh, actually I have something in my buffer. This something must be for you and it sends that request that I smuggled to that user. To be really specific, we performed a kind of HTTP smuggling called an HTTP desync attack. In this case, a front-end server waits for a response and it thinks it only gets a single one, but the back-end sends two, which causes a desynchronization between the front-end and the back-end. We can see that in reality by sending this request and then requesting a page that should give us a 404. We can see that the first request we sent as that user gives us a 200, and then the second, exactly the same request, gives us a 404. And that is what you should be looking for when trying to validate a potential HTTP request smuggling issue. Now, just to be complete, let's send this exact request through our Nginx server, and we see that in this case, since there is no front-end server and no discrepancies, it just responds with a pipeline response as expected. It receives two requests and it responded accordingly. I hope that this cleared up what you should look for when hunting for HTTP request smuggling vulnerabilities. That is all for today. 
We looked into a lot of stuff, so let's quickly recap to make sure we did not forget anything. We started off with a theoretical overview of HTTP request smuggling. We learned about a modern architecture with a front-end and a back-end server and how they handle the content length and the transfer encoding headers. We noticed that a discrepancy between the handling of these headers can cause significant damage. It is thus very important that HTTP request smuggling vulnerabilities get disclosed and fixed as soon as possible. In order to detect these vulnerabilities, we learned about Smuggler, a tool that can help us identify these issues. However, we saw that when running automated tools, we need to always double check the results for false positives, as there could be a lot of factors that are out of our control, such as a server hiccup. Lastly, we learned about one of the biggest misconceptions concerning HTTP request smuggling, and that is HTTP pipelining. This obscure, often forgotten feature can lead us to believe we have found a valid issue, whereas in reality, that's not the case. We looked into it and compared an instance of HTTP pipelining with a real request smuggling example. And from that, we learned how to distinguish between the two. And that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, don't be afraid to like the video and share it with your friends. If you have any questions or comments, I'd be thrilled to hear about them. But that's all. Have a nice day and I'll see you in the next one.